Hello, welcome. Good evening. After a few people have already said welcome, so welcome again. Uh, this is a, a, a very auspicious, well, a very important day, uh, not least because the, uh, the women's basketball team just won a glorious victory. And as those of you who were there will be able to attest, about an hour ago or so, the men, even though they didn't quite make it in the end, um, had a, an absolutely heroic, heroic game, getting that close to winning in the end. But uh, congratulations to them. So, but we're here really in, in large numbers, and it's, it's really uh, ins inspirational to see the, these large numbers um, for the uh, visit of a team, the, the senior team really of Amnesty International, um, led by its Secretary General. Um, but the, I, I will reveal his name, Sir Shetty, but it's not up to me to introduce him, of course. As you know, we always have students doing this. Um, before I introduce the student who will do that, what I will do is to tell you what Georgetown is presenting to the team and to um, Salil, other than, of course, this experience and your, your scintillating presence. Um, and it, because it gives you some idea also, perhaps those of you who might not have known this yet, of the kinds of things that your faculty and researchers here actually do. One of the, one of the things we're giving is a book on, pers on migrant labor in the Gulf, produced by the CIRS here. Another one is one of the many CRS uh, short studies on free mobility in the Gulf Cooperation Council. Then, of course, there is Dr. Kamrava's book on Qatar, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. And finally, there is the journal, which is co-produced by us, by, by Georgetown and Exeter, Journal of Arabian Studies. Um, and some of you might have picked up in the media a paper that's published in the latest issue of this, which is all about um, low-income mi migrants in Qatar, a profile of, and interestingly, that study was funded by Qatar National Research Fund. So these are the, these are the, um, the presents that we'll be giving uh, City. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Atul, Atul Menon, most of you will know him. Um, for those of you who don't, and of course the team from Amnesty perhaps uh, haven't all met him yet, he's one of our class of 2015. He's an international economics major, um, and he's been very active um, in this sort of general field. He's been working with Akash Jayaprakash, who of course is an alumnus of ours and is now working with Qatar Foundation on their mi uh, migrant labor project. Um, and Atul has also been involved um, in a project that started out, I think, uh, as a, a Europe, an undergraduate research experience project with Professor Ganesh Seshan um, on the financial literacy of migrants in Qatar. So um, Atul, in fact, has also been um, award, awarded, well, his, 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 his work on these sorts of areas has been uh, recognized internationally by the, um, uh, I think it's called the Palm, Palmer Leadership Award um, for, for work on these sorts of areas, and it's, it's uh, something that only three people in the world get every year, any one year. So, on that note, and without further ado, over to Atul. Thank you, Dean Nonneman. Good evening, everyone. Um, this afternoon, I had the unique opportunity to have lunch with an inspirational individual. He was an Indian national, and I was amazed to know he had studied in one of the most prestigious institutes in India, the Indian Institute of Management. And then he went on to do his master's at the London School of Economics. His academic credentials were obviously very impressive, but so was his work profile. From 1998 to 2003, he was chief executive of ActionAid and is credited with transforming the organization into the world's foremost international development NGO. He also served 
as the director of the United Nations Millennium Campaign from 2003 to 2010 and played a pivotal role in building global advocacy campaign for the achievement of Millennium Development Goals. Amongst us today, we have the very same individual who currently leads the worldwide movement to end human rights violations. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the eighth Secretary General of Amnesty International, Mr. Salil Shetty. I should just start by saying that Atul had promised me that he's not going to start by embarrassing uh, me, but I guess he's forgotten his promise. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dean, and, uh, and all Georgetown students. It's a pleasure. I, I normally don't uh, miss out an opportunity to speak to young people now that I, I don't categorize as young. But uh, I think it's really important that we have opportunities like this, and thank you for providing me. Nobody told me about the basketball game before this. I would have liked to have joined that, but uh, next time. Um, the, the way we wanted to, and also I, I must say that it's also a very special occasion because I have my nephew here who I've actually not met since he was this high, so I'm very happy to have a 15-year-old in the room as well. Didn't want to embarrass him, but <laughs> thank you for coming as well. Uh, the, the way we want to do this really is to, uh, for me to say a little bit at the beginning, and then we want to make it a lot more interactive. We want to uh, make sure that you get a chance to ask us. If we have uh, just by, we're very privileged actually to have quite a key set of people from Amnesty International here today. Um, so we should try, and I, I think you should benefit from their presence. We have, uh, let me introduce them. Stefan, who's sitting right back there. Stefan leads Amnesty in France. And uh, the French uh, part of Amnesty is one of our most powerful amnesties. They have, uh, mobilize very large numbers of French people on most campaigns. We also raise a lot of uh, money from the French public, and Stefan is leading our work there. So he's with us uh, in, on this trip. We have uh, James Lynch, who's hiding somewhere. OK, <laughs> James not hiding. He's right here. Uh, and James, actually, if you want to quiz anything about Qatar, he's, he's our man. He's actually working. He's leading our work. You, many of you know that we're actually here to launch a report on the whole issue of migrant workers uh, in Qatar and their challenges. I know that many of you are studying labor migration issues. Um, we are launching this report on Monday, so we don't want to talk too much about it today, because otherwise the media who have been embargoed uh, till Monday to talk about it wouldn't be happy with us, because I'm sure you'll all be tweeting, which uh, so the BBCs and CNNs won't be happy if we say too much about it. So we, we're happy to talk about it, but not in, in great detail. Uh, then we have uh, Phil, who's sitting there at that table. So Phil Luther is our director for Middle East and uh, North Africa region, which, which covers quite a vast swathe of countries, countries which have been keeping us very busy in the last two, three years. So, so Phil will certainly be in a position to answer any questions directly which are more regional in nature. So he covers all of these countries. So we have a big uh, sort of, well, it's not big enough, but we have, a, we have a great team of people who work in the Middle East and North Africa with Phil. And then uh, most importantly, we have uh, Nicola with us, Nicola Duckworth, who's our senior director for global research. So she, she oversees the entire research program for Amnesty International. So we're very fortunate to have her. And she's certainly the one with, uh, I think I was saying earlier, if you add up all our experience and expertise, she probably has more than that. So she's, you're very, very, very fortunate to have her with us. So what we want to do today really is that um, I wanted to sort of uh, take you on a journey which explains a little bit, of course, of the problems and the challenges that we face in the world on human rights. But more importantly, to talk about the opportunities and what we can do about it. Um, and I think that's, I'm hoping that that's actually what you're more interested in. And then, of course, say a little bit about where Amnesty figures in this canvas. So that's essentially what I wanted to do. And in order for us to, to start that process, I was going to ask you to join me in a small uh, exercise. And this is, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it should, it'll cause you a mild discomfort, because we wanted you to feel a little bit of discomfort, which a lot of people face on a daily basis. So uh, if you would indulge me, um, and. We ideally would have liked to have black eye masks, 
but we tried in all the Doha supermarket stores, and I think they didn't have enough eye masks for all of you. So if you don't mind taking the napkin which you have in front of you and tying it around your eyes in a way that you're not able to see anything. So it's a very short exercise. Um, if you can indulge me, I think it'll be interesting. Shouldn't last for more than a minute. So. And no cheating, please. So anybody who can still see after tying it, raise your hand. So I know. You can still see? That's not a very good idea. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. So we, I just wanted to give you a sense of, uh, I mean this, it's, it's a very minuscule sense of what a combination of noise and darkness uh, can do. How do we turn this off? <laughs> I move it to the next one, isn't it? Okay. I'll come to this in a minute, but essentially what I wanted to do with this was to give you a sense of you know, what a lot of people experience in prisons and outside as well of a very mild form of torture. Uh, somebody was telling me it's like going to a nightclub. Apparently the nightclubs these days have similar levels of noise. But hopefully it's, uh, and it's, it's, you just have to mentally multiply this a hundred times. That this, and this is just one of the various sort of tried and tested methods of torture. Uh, and if you think of torture, and you, if you think that this is a relic from some medieval times, uh, I want to assure you that, unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, we did a piece of research which Phil and team led on last year. In Syria alone, the, we found that they were using 31 different ways of torturing the people they were capturing, which includes um, you know, horrific things like uh, crucifixion, uh, rape, um, and electric shocks, and we're talking about just in the space of the last year alone. And if you look at the numbers we have here on the screen up here, this is an annual report. Amnesty produces a uh, kind of a state of human rights report every year. And this is data from the last annual report which we had. So we had 57 countries who lock up people, uh, what we call prisoners of conscience, which means these are people who are locked up just because of their identity or their beliefs or because they've expressed freely some of their thoughts. Uh, unfortunately, of course, this includes a lot of people from this part of the world. This includes human rights defenders in Bahrain. It includes uh, social media bloggers in Kuwait and the United Arab Emirates. Uh, it also, unfortunately, includes a poet in this country. So uh, these are people who are locked up just because of their views and their ideas. We have 80 countries which uh, continue in this day and age to use unfair, in a systematic way, uh, unfair trials, which means people who are in the first instance locked up arbitrarily don't have much of a chance of coming out uh, based on a fair trial, internationally agreed fair trial process. We have 31 uh, countries who forcibly disappeared people in the last year, which, which this report accounted for. Um, and I mean, the numbers are, are, are pretty scary. If you look at the, uh, I don't know, this also covers the other set. I mean, I'm not going through all of the numbers here. Um, I think you, you can see the figures expressed here, but I think if you look at the, the status of the, the people who are, who are displaced, either internally or externally or as refugees, 15 million people are registered as refugees and 12 million people were stateless. This includes like the Bidun, who you may be familiar with. Uh, I, I met several of them in Kuwait as well. 
Um, and generally speaking, when Amnesty puts out numbers, it's mostly what we, what we say is that this is at a minimum. In most cases, because we don't always get data on everything. So by and large, you can be sure that the numbers are much worse in most cases. Now, if you also, I mean, this is just in terms of the kind of big obvious issues. If you add to this the whole issue of poverty and economic, social, cultural rights, uh, which are also denied to so many people, housing, water, sanitation, education, we're talking in that case of you know hundreds of millions of people. So the scale is massive, the gravity is very serious. If you can also think geographically of countries like North Korea, uh, certainly some parts of China and some dimensions, China would be in that list. Uh, think of places like Belarus or the Democratic Republic of Congo. And you know, the overall picture you get is not a very pretty picture when it comes to human rights. So people ask me, so don't you get depressed in your job? Like, How do you, with all these bad things happening and all stacking up, how do you kind of wake up in the morning? And I always say to them that, yeah, in a sense, yes, it is, if you put it all together, it is quite depressing. Uh, but at the same time, I think what also one finds in this job and the jobs that uh, Nicola, Phil, and all of us from Amnesty do here is that we also, almost on a daily basis, meet people who are just incredibly inspiring people. So, and these are people who are standing up for their own rights, despite all of the forces which are working against them. And, and we've seen this in so many parts of the world, I'm gonna come back to that. But equally, I think what we find is that there are other people who are not personally affected by the injustices or not, whose rights are not abused, but they themselves have made a choice in their life to stand with the people whose rights are being abused. So I mean, I, I was very inspired by Akash and the group of people we met here, um, Atul and many others this afternoon, but, and we just chanced upon these guys. I, I'm pretty sure that there are many, I'm assuming that this room has got many more such people and there are many other people in Qatar and the Gulf region and um, in the wider sort of uh, Arab world where people are standing with those whose rights are being abused and that, to us is a huge source of inspiration. But of course, in, you know, we also always have, uh, you know, whenever we, 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 wherever we travel, we always meet people who also consider themselves realists. So they always tell us why things are not going to change. Uh, and, and of course, you know, you have to be realistic. You shouldn't be having pipe dreams. But if we always follow the realists, then we're going to be in deep trouble. So I always uh, quote uh, this particular a statement from Bernard Shaw, uh, who, which says that you know people who say it cannot be done should not interrupt those who are actually going about doing it. Uh, and in some ways, I would say that uh, I know that there wouldn't be people like this in this audience. But the story of Amnesty International is kind of a story which which challenges this this notion. And this this scandal which you see here is really the spirit of amnesty. And I, I'm sure you've heard of the slogan before, or this, this, it's meant to be, paradoxically, it's meant to be a Chinese proverb which said that either you can curse the darkness or you light a candle. So Peter Benenson, who created Amnesty International, chose to go with lighting a candle. And so that's the kind of essence of what we're talking about. And when amnesty was formed, um, apparently it was called one of the larger lunacies of the time because the idea that you could challenge dictators, that you could somehow fight against torture, or that you could release people who locked up in prisons seemed such an insane idea. But, uh, and one of the things which Margaret Mead said, I wanted to quote for you as well. Again, some of you would be familiar, none of these, these, uh, these quotes are that uh, new or original, but I thought they were very appropriate. I mean, because you know, often we are, and uh, watching these guys today in Qatar, uh, Akash and this small group of people that he's working with, you kind of think, you know, that, because we're always told that, you know, you can't really do, what can you do? You're just three people, you know, you can't change anything. And Margaret Mead's statement was very appropriate for that, you know, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, that's the only thing that ever has changed the world. And the Amnesty story, interestingly, is exactly about that. It's small local groups which were formed in the early 70s and 80s 
in different parts of the world. And today, it's more than 3 million members who've come together. So we've lost count of how many groups we have, hundreds of thousands of groups. I don't know, Stefan, in France alone, you have how many groups now? 400, 400 groups in France, so you can imagine. You know? um, I, I had this uh, amazing opportunity. When we went to Cairo, we went uh, to this small town called Suez, which is outside Cairo. And we met this, uh, and we, it was a difficult meeting. It was late evening. We went to meet the mothers of the two martyrs, the first two people who were shot by the security forces who stood up against, at that time, the Mubarak regime. And they had, uh, nothing had happened, you know, there's no accountability. The, the people who had actually killed them were scot-free. And, and so there was a lot of anger in the room saying, you know, what's going on? It's months since this happened and there's no justice. So the meeting was over and then a group of people came up and, and came to us, there were a few of us from Amnesty, and they said, oh, we're so happy to meet a group from Amnesty. So, so we said, we're very happy to meet you too. And so we said, who are you? And they said, oh, we are a local Amnesty group. So through the years of, uh, you know, I mean, not in a formal sense, they're just self-organized, you know? So, and, and can you imagine through those Mubarak years, the 30 years or whatever that Mubarak was running the show, there was a group there which was self-organized and associated itself somehow with Amnesty, you know? And that was, uh, to me, I mean, so this is how one keeps uh, inspired and keeps moving. Um, I'll come back to this uh, in a minute about this particular experience. But over the years, I think that apart from the groups, uh, what we, just to give you an idea of, you know, what kinds of things we've done, I think the, the major piece of work which Amnesty has done over these years, of course, is to fight for political prisoners and their release. And it's quite difficult to keep account of that because we're talking about, you know, thousands if not more. And some of them are very iconic political prisoners, um, you know, like Aung San Suu Kyi, for example, who is a great source of inspiration to many young people across the world. So she's, of course, kind of a five-star iconic political prisoner, if you wish. But most of the people Amnesty works for and is fighting for are unsung heroes and heroines. Nobody has heard their name. They're languishing somewhere. Nobody knows them. They come out and you know there's no, obviously for the families and the close uh, relatives and friends, it's very important. But so many people across the world who are locked up. Um, so that's a big piece of what we've done. But also I think the other one which I often like to quote is the work on death penalty. Now, Death penalty is one of Amnesty's earliest campaigns. And when Amnesty started campaigning on this probably three, four, three decades ago or so, there were only about, I would say, 40 countries or so who were not using death penalty, who were not executing uh, people who they designated as worthy of execution. Uh, today, it's kind of flipped. So we now have only about 50 countries or so who continue to use death penalty. So I mean, just to show that you know, if you if you want, and at the time when you know it was even outside the legal framework in some ways, what Amnesty was calling for to end death penalty was not obviously inside the international legal framework. So we were calling for something which at that point would have been seen as quite audacious. But over this period of time, that change has happened as well. And this example, which I wanted to talk about, was in a sense, it's the most recent example. It's very fresh in in our minds anyway, because. Uh, the campaign to create an arms trade treaty, and I'll explain what that is, was started 20 years ago by Amnesty. And, and not just Amnesty, by the way, whenever I talk about all these things, whether it's death penalty or arms trade treaty, we, we always work with a wide range of partners, uh, often at the very local level, but also sometimes regionally and globally. So uh, the arms trade treaty is uh, a very interesting story because uh, I'm sure some of you who are studying economics, etc., you'll know that the whole issue of uh, world trade, how countries trade between each other, is a much regulated and much discussed area. So even if you want to send a banana, say, from one country to another, you have to go through so many procedures, etc. But when it came to conventional arms and the sale of arms, there was, ha there was pretty close to no regulation at the global level which, as you can imagine, led to the arms reaching so many countries and, and uh, groups who really would be using it to abuse human rights. So if you think of Syria, for example, we always quote the Syria example as, if we were able to make sure that the Assad regime, and of course now uh, so many others as well, had not, uh, anybody who was going to use it for human rights violations, if they didn't get arms in the first place, we wouldn't have been in the situation that we're facing today. So after a lot of campaign, a lot of effort, we finally 
in earlier this year, we actually finally have a UN arms trade treaty. But it was quite amazing because even in the final stages of negotiation, which many of us from the Amnesty side have been involved in, we were being told that you know it's not possible. You guys are dreamers. You know, just become realistic. Get real. It won't happen. And I think the fact that we kept our sights high and kept pushing, I think we have, we have, of course, it doesn't mean that if you have a treaty, everything changes. Of course not. You know, we, there's a lot of challenges at the implementation level. Uh, interestingly, in the Gulf area, it's UAE who've actually signed up to it. Uh, you might be surprised by that, but they have signed up. They're the, they're the first Gulf country to sign, and we hope that many more will follow. And of course, once, we, once they sign, the next step is ratification, so we'll keep pushing for that to happen. Uh, but it's important, you know, even when the International Criminal Court was created, uh, there were not that many people enthusiastically coming. But now it's happened, we have the court, it's functioning. So these global uh, standards, norms, institutions are all very important for us to then make sure that at the national and local level, some of these things can get translated into action. So I wanted to just, uh, you know, talk to you about this. But in a sense, I think the most important question is where do we go from here? because there's, there's all the history. And I, in, from my perspective, the breakthrough really we're looking at uh, has to be, oh, maybe I should show you another one, which is the Ai Weiwei story first. So uh, some of you may recognize, do all of you know this man? How many of you know him? Who's ready to explain who he is? You want to say who he is? Go ahead. Pretty good description, <laughs> better than I could have done. Um, but I mean, it's it's you know this this statement I found very you know uh, very. He's always uh, and he joined us last week over a, a Skype call in a meeting I was, and he's so creative. You know, even the way he expresses himself. So you could you could get a sense of that from this this statement here. But to me, this was important because if you think of what's happening in the world today you can see that this is exactly what we're seeing in so many parts of the world. Of course, the Arab Spring or revolutions or whatever you want to call it are the most immediate and the most kind of talked about examples. But these protests are happening across the world. Uh, it's happening in India and in my country. Many of you would have heard the rape case of this uh, woman in Delhi. And, uh, you know, rape is not new in India. <laughs> in fact, it's very normal. I, I, I'm a bit surprised that it took so long for people to kind of wake up on that issue. But the fact that we have social media, that young people are feeling a sense of outrage, you had uh, you know, very large numbers of people. And these are not people from the sort of NGO activist type. These ordinary people who said, no more. You know, we are not going to accept this nonsense. Um, and Brazil, Brazil had almost a million people coming out in the streets in the last uh, few months. Um, even in Russia, a place like Russia where it's very difficult for you to come out, post-elections, uh, you know, we had people, or in the run-up to the elections, we had very large numbers of people coming out. And you can imagine that when people come out in these places, and this, of course, is the, is the one you'd be very familiar with from Saudi Arabia. So, you know, when people do this, they're doing it at great risk. Some of you, um, most of you would know that there's been a ban on driving of, for women in Saudi Arabia. So when women, very recently, many of them decided that they won't actually publicly uh, challenge this, this ban, they're doing it at a huge personal risk. So this is happening across the world. And in that sense, we are seeing a period of quite unprecedented change uh, in many, many parts of the world. So I wanted to take you to where we, where we go from here. And I, to me, I mean, there's many ways in which you can answer that question. You know, what is the next breakthrough? I mean, if we have all of these things happening, what's the next big step? If you want to see human rights and justice for all, uh, what would be the next big step? And to me, the most obvious answer to the question is that is there a way in which we can connect all these dots of outrage, of passion, of anger, of resistance to injustice 
Is there a way of pulling this together into a truly global people's human rights movement? That's, to me, where the hope comes from. As I said, that's the inspiration that we get as we travel. But it's always a challenge when you meet people doing this in an isolated way. Is there a way in which we can connect? Because fundamentally, the push is for justice, that we take injustice personally, that we want our governments and authorities to become accountable. Those are common things, whether you're fighting against corruption in China, or you're fighting for you know, land in Brazil, or whatever the issue is, or you know, we were talking about fishermen, or fisher people here in Qatar. The underlying issues of justice and human rights are the same. So is there a way in which we can connect it and create a global people's movement for human rights? Is, is it, I think, the challenge of the coming decade. Now, but in order for us to be able to see this, you know, a grand vision coming into reality, there's a few things which obviously need to happen between this kind of vision and, and achieving the vision. And I think the first step has to be that, and of course, you know, the, the reason why I think it's so important to connect these dots is because there is a kind of a prevailing perception that when we talk about human rights, we are essentially talking about some Western notion that human rights is not for us, it's a Western concept which all of us are kind of have to suffer because it's being imposed from the West. Uh, this, obviously, for those of you who are thinking about it, and of course, for those people who are suffering human rights abuses, this is the most ridiculous thing to say because uh, if you're actually suffering, if you're being tortured in some kind of a cell uh, in, uh, in Egypt, say, and then somebody comes and tells you, no, 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 this is a Western concept, I mean, we know that most of the violations are happening in the developing world, in the, in the countries of the developing world, or however you want to classify it, you know, the South. So the idea, it's certainly not in the West, I mean, but I'm coming to the question of violations of the West in a minute. But to, in order to, if we make something which is much more global, it will fundamentally challenge this notion. Now, if you want to get to this global movement idea, the question is what needs to be in place. And I would say the first thing that needs to happen is that the Western countries and the Western powers and the, and the Western sort of populations, in a sense, have to bridge the gap between what they practice and what they preach. Because we have massive sort of double standards which we see in the way they operate. So as long as those double standards continue, it becomes a bit difficult for us to take this concept and make it much more global. So you take the United States, for example. Now, First and foremost, you know, when we think about hu human rights and uh, United States, the image which comes to my mind is Guantanamo Bay. Now, how is it possible for this country which champions human rights across the world <clears throat> to continue with this, you know, scar on their face, which is Guantanamo? And, uh, of course, President Obama has made promises, and then, then we are told that, you know, it's very complicated, the Congress won't, I mean, you know, so if we come, for example, to Qatar, I met this morning with the Prime Minister and we say, you know, you have to do something about your migrant rights problem. If he starts telling me, you know, actually I can't do it because I've got this, I've got that, okay, but that's your problem, not mine, you know. So if, I, if Obama promises he's going to close Guantanamo, then he starts saying, actually I have a problem with the Congress, uh, you know, my people in Texas are not happy. So you, know, you, you are signing up to international obligations. You're the head of the country, the state and the government. You've got to keep the commitment. So that's, as far as the U.S. is concerned, we have another big challenge with the U.S. Most recently, of course, is that they simply have to stop defending their massive invasion of privacy. Uh, you've seen what Snowden has revealed. Assange had talked about that before. And, you know, the idea that they can defend uh, this notion that they can invade people's privacy at the scale that they're doing is just shocking. Now, coming to Europe, and here I think we've got some images as well. Uh, this, this picture is from Lampedusa, I think. Certainly it's the African migrants trying to come into Europe. They're actually trying to escape uh, persecution from North Africa very often and coming into Europe. And you have countries like Italy and Greece who intercept. This is a kind of interception at sea, uh, I, I think, picture image which we have. Uh, and you know the, the number of lives which have been lost, I mean, we've been documenting many of this for a long time. Of course, we had some very dramatic cases most recently, and the, oh, it's only when it becomes I mean, large numbers of people have to die before the media picks it up. You know, but this problem has been there for a long time now. So Europe is, uh, is you know, they have in terms of the violations on refugees, migrants, asylum seekers, they are uh, they they're violating 
European laws and international laws on a consistent basis for quite a long time. So this is a whole other dimension to it. Um, on the question of the privacy and invasion of privacy, it's very interesting that until such time as European leaders' phones were not being intercepted, they seem to think it's okay. But in the last month, when they discovered that actually their leaders' phones were being tapped, they seem to be very upset with what the, what the Americans are doing. So they're not saying, why are you doing this? They're saying, why are you doing this to us? So, so all of these kind of double standards and hypocrisy which we have simply has to be challenged. So, and that's, so that's the first, I think the first key piece, and we certainly from our side are doing everything we can to make sure that there is a much more level playing field. Uh, but then I was going to come to the, oh yeah, and certainly this is, a, this, this still is from Syria, the visual is from St Syria. So if you take the issue of uh, Syria, now the Western powers have been, in our view, in a sense, rightly uh, opposed to, and you know, they've been very uh, vocal in their opposition to the Assad regime and the violations which the Assad regime have caused. Um, of course, now we're in a situation where it's gone, you know, it's totally out of control. We have violations from all sides. But certainly when we started, the Western powers were rightly, I think, raising the question about uh, the human rights abuses caused by the Assad regime. But we are now in a situation where there's a serious humanitarian crisis. We have massive number of refugees leaving the country. I think two million or so is the number of refugees. These are all official statistics, you know, so you can imagine that. Uh, I normally, when these numbers come, I think that if there's an official statistic, by and large, you can be sure it's much worse. Um, and then, of course, you have internal displacement, which is even larger in number, I think 4 million, I don't know, and the numbers keep increasing as we speak. But if you think of the 2 million refugees who are fleeing from persecution, uh, and then when, the, when they seek uh, refugee status in Europe, um, you can imagine, you know, you would expect rather that the Europeans would say yes, you know, the Assad regime is violating uh, your, uh, your human rights. Now, of course, the rebel groups are also doing the same. So we have to give you uh, a status, a refugee status here, because they are, they are totally legitimate in claiming refugee status. So you'd expect them to say, yes, we understand, come here. But the, the response is quite the opposite. In fact, there's, I think only Sweden and Germany, if any, have actually said yes. I don't know if the Nikola can tell us as we, or even that is not really the case, is it? Is it? Only Sweden, okay, really only Sweden. And that too, 5,000 is the number they're talking about, less than 5,000. So, you know, the scale of the problem, 2 million refugees, and uh, Sweden is the only country which is talking about, you know, actually saying they'll do something, and that's at a scale which is almost insignificant. And then you think of the reality in, in the neighboring countries like Lebanon and Jordan, which are relatively, I mean, they're not, you can't say that the poorest countries in the world, but if you compare them with European countries, the burden which they are taking on this from Syrian refugees is massive. You know? So obviously, you know, then when you have Europeans or Americans going and lecturing about human rights, they naturally turn around and say, what are you talking about? You know, can you do some, can you tell us what to do once you start doing something yourself? So I think that's very important in the first instance to challenge Western governments about their own uh, standards and double standards and the hypocrisy. Now the other piece, which is now coming to the, this might be a familiar picture to you, which is the UN Security Council. Now, the UN Security Council, as you know, is made up of the permanent five members who are uh, Western powers plus China and Russia, the, the mix which you're familiar with. But if you think of uh, this body as the body which is meant to uh, make sure that we are ensure world peace, um, we know that we are signally failing in that. Syria is a great example, but there are many, many other examples. But even parking the UN Security Council for a minute, if you think of all the global, multilateral, global governance, global decision-making processes, whether you take trade, climate change, nuclear talks, Palestine, you know, you, you can name any one of these. And if you think of uh, where we are, the answer is pretty much nowhere. So what we are facing in the world today is a complete paralysis of global governance and a complete vacuum of global leadership. And particularly when some of the countries like the US simply have lost that moral leadership which they had at one point, you could argue they had at one point, uh, what we see is a massive vacuum. Now the interesting, I mean that is, is kind of known to all of you, I don't think that's uh, kind of aha information. But the question really is, we now have uh, emerging economies which are very significant in size, you know, the Brazils, Indias, 
Nigeria, Mexico, Indonesia, South Africa. And these are, because you know, when you think of BRICS or these new, new emerging countries, you, we say BRICS, but Russia and China, at least they don't claim that they stand for human rights and they don't claim that they're democracy. So they're in a different space from India, Brazil, South Africa, Mexico, Nigeria, et cetera, who wear democracy and human rights on their sleeve. So we say, okay, so if you stand for democracy and human rights, what are you doing in the Security Council? Or how do you vote in the UN? And the interesting thing is that the way in which they vote is not actually very different from how the Western powers vote, which is essentially looking at their own self-interest and nothing to do with principles and values, et cetera. You know, most of the African countries, Nigeria, South Africa, you look at the voting pattern of these emerging powers in the UN, uh, they are not showing any leadership. In fact, I always joke about this, but not joke. I mean, I always say that if most uh, Indians knew as to how uh, India votes in the United Nations, they would be quite shocked because by and large, I suspect, we've not done some detailed analysis, but certainly what few things I've seen is that very often India votes in the same way as Pakistan. And as you know, in India, if you say you vote like Pakistan, there's nothing worse than that. <laughs> This is not a problem between the people, it's a problem that the governments have caused. But, so the behavior is completely different from what they speak, you know, so there's, they say, oh no, no, China is, a, is not a democracy, or India is a democracy. But why do you vote exactly like China then, or just like Pakistan, if you claim to be a democracy? You know? So I think that the question is that, can we really get these new emerging powers who, who claim to stand for all these good things to behave in a different way? And the question is, why do they behave in that way? And fundamentally, in my view, the reason why they behave in that way and get away with behaving in that way is because there is no accountability for their foreign policy decision making inside those countries. There is no public constituency which is holding them to account. So if you take South Africa, for example, which, you know, if you think of the history of South Africa and where they've come from, they should be global champions for human rights. But I can assure you that nobody in South Africa, pretty much nobody, I mean, when I say nobody, not people who are in the foreign ministry, but the average you know, citizens of this country, they would have no clue as to what South Africa is doing at the UN. So they get away with this. Um, and this is something which, you know, we, it's, it's an ambitious agenda to have, to build a global constituency for human rights, which is going to challenge uh, world powers to do the right thing not just the old existing powers, but also the new emerging ones. But I think that that is the bold vision we should have. Certainly from Amnesty side, we've tried to do, we've started trying to do something about it in our own small way. So we've established um, Amnesty offices and presence now in the last two years in Brazil, in India. Uh, we're hoping to set up something in Egypt. If <laughs> nobody has a clue as to which way Egypt is going, but hopefully it'll, it'll lead some kind of an equilibrium. So in many of these countries, we really want to build a base, build the you know, movement in those countries because Amnesty has more than three million members, but unfortunately not many in these places because historically these countries are not where the human rights debates have happened. So that's a, a, a big challenge we have in front of us. But I mean, this, this is of course, you know, some examples of the work we're doing in Africa to mobilize people. Um, and, and Brazil, I was just saying that, you know, we were, I was saying that we, we've launched uh, Amnesty. This is a picture. I was there a couple of months ago, and, and one of the big challenges we have in Brazil is with the indigenous communities there. So this was the Guarani, Kiowa uh, indigenous tribes uh, who have been pushed out. In fact, if you go there, I don't know how many of you, any of you have been to Brazil or familiar with Brazil in this group? No, it's a long way from Qatar, I guess, or from wherever any of you come from. But it's quite amazing, you know, that if you go there and see the living conditions of these people and the realities there, it's, it's, it's literally like the Wild West. So you have the sugarcane uh, owners, the sugarcane uh, manufacturing units, the owners there, they just come and push these people out of the land, physically with guns and, and weapons, and they have absolutely no protection. So there's a lot of work to be done domestically in these countries, in the emerging countries, and of course, what the role they can play at the global level. So I wanted to really close by saying that, you know, there's lots of, I mean, these are of course macro things and we can, we can talk a lot about uh, the macro questions. The question finally is of course, what you could do from where you sit, how you could contribute, et cetera. And certainly we, we don't believe that we can do anything without the support of ordinary people. In fact, Amnesty story is one of ordinary people coming together to create extraordinary change. So how, how you could be involved, of course, I always say that the first and most important uh, step that you, from your side, you need to take is to really educate yourself. 
There's a very small booklet which is in my bag there, which I can show you later on, which I see Nicola also carries often as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's quite interesting, actually, because normally when the United Nations produces something, it's unbearable. You can't read it because it's so boring and it's so big. But this is a document produced a long time ago. It's very short, and if you want to get a, you know, just an inspiring document which tells you the story in a few pages, that I would say, you know, that's a very good starting point. But of course, that just gives you the big picture. But I think the first step is for, for you to educate yourself and familiarize yourself with the issues. I know you're doing that already. Um, certainly from, from Amnesty's perspective, we, we are constantly running campaigns and we hope you will join our campaigns. A big one we are pushing for right now in the run-up to the Winter Olympics in Sochi. As you know, the massive human rights violations and problems in, in Russia. So those of you who find that important and who feel outraged about it, uh, we hope you'll, you'll sign up to our Russia campaign. Uh, so that's, I think, very soon. I think we have the, our, is that the picture from Russia? Oh yeah, so that's, that's one which I think we had, uh, this is from our, is that from Germany, is it? Right. Yeah, but we have similar campaigns in different places and you could certainly, uh, I think this is supposed to say www.amnesty.org. <laughs> must be some NSA thing from the United States that's <laughs> blocking my, so. But certainly we've got, you know, tons of campaigns. Uh, we, we do something in December called the Letter Writing Marathon, uh, which is a great, we have millions of people who sign up to that. Um, you're all welcome to sign. There are many sort of emblematic campaigns in that. Uh, certainly one of the ones which, uh, which would be of particular interest to you, I think, is the village of Nabi Saleh, where we have that, that campaign is focused, on to, is focused on stopping the brutal treatment of the villages uh, in this village, which is occupied military occupation, is what the, the campaign is about to end military occupation, to end brutal treatment of the people in Nabi Saleh. So, but there are so many such campaigns which we, we constantly have. Of course, if you want to go beyond campaigning, you want to become members, very welcome. If you want to big, make a big financial contribution, even more welcome. <laughs> uh, the interesting thing about Amnesty is that we don't take, uh, for our research, our campaigning, our advocacy work, we take no money at all from governments or companies. So we're totally dependent on ordinary people contributing. So we have more than 3 million people. So it's kind of an Obama model, if you wish. So it's small contributions, $10, $15 a month people contribute. And that allows us to retain our independence, our impartiality, you know. So this morning when I spoke to the Prime Minister, I could say to him that we are not at anybody's bidding. Uh, we stand for what we believe in, and what we believe in is in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You don't have to go too far to find out what we stand for. So that's very important. So we really hope that, and I was saying to the Dean earlier and to our friends who are in the student community as well, uh, one of the interesting things about Amnesty is that our history of Amnesty actually is very tied in to the history of uh, students and, and youth movements across the world because the initial uh, groups were formed quite a lot in colleges and schools, in, in particularly in Europe and North America. So we have amnesty school groups and college groups in so many places across the world. If that's something of interest to you, we're very happy to talk to you. We have a lot of materials for students and, and I'm sure Stefan can talk much more about the kinds of things we're doing with French uh, universities and campuses. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's one in, in Georgetown in the US. Um, we, I'm sure, I understand that you have a human rights a group of some sort here. If those of you who are in that would like to uh, see how you could work more closely with Amnesty, we'd obviously be very happy to, to talk to you about that.